following sermon was presented on Sunday, May 29th, 2016 by Pastor Daniel. It is titled Exodus TLDR, Part 1. For more, please visit gladtidingschurchofgod.com. And it's part of a sermon series called The Bible TLDR. As I mentioned, it's going to be an ongoing sermon series. And uh, TLDR stands for Too Long, Didn't Read. And it's an abbreviation that you might see on the internet. You could use it. Uh, it refers to, to coming across something that is simply too long and you don't want to take the time to read it. And uh, because so many people feel that way about the Bible, it's just simply too long, I don't want to read it. Uh, I want to do something with this sermon series where it gives people an opportunity to, to know what's in the Bible. What does the Bible have to say? What, what does it all mean? And we can't go through every single bit of the Bible, but we certainly will touch upon some of the more important matters, especially as it relates to what I'm calling the overall narrative of the Bible. That, there, that the Bible is made up of individual stories and books, but there's one big story that the Bible is telling us, and we're going to touch upon that, and I'm going to show you how the parts of the Bible inform the overall narrative of the Bible. And so today we are going to look at the first 14 chapters of the book of Exodus. And uh, so, some of the books of the Bible are much too large for me to do in one sermon. So we're going to split Exodus up into two books. And the name Exodus, you, you've, have you ever wondered where do these names even come from for these books of the Bible? Well, the name Exodus is a Greek word and it means going out. And it refers to the Exodus from Egypt. So when the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible was made, the Septuagint, they named this book Exodus. That's appropriate, appropriate enough for, for that name uh, to be, for it to be named that. But the Hebrew name of the book is Shemot, which means the names or names. And it comes from the very first uh, line in Exodus, Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. So the book of Exodus begins with the people of Israel and Egypt, and that's because that's where the book of Genesis ended. The book of Genesis ended with Jacob and his family, the people of Israel, moving to Egypt to be with Joseph. But as we saw in the story of Joseph, Joseph had, had risen up the ranks, so to speak. He had become uh, the second in command in Egypt. You know, Joseph was nobody and God used what happened to him to, to save Egypt and to save the known area of, the, of that part of the world. But as is the case with, with history, things don't always stay the same. And it says in Exodus 1.8, eventually a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He didn't know Joseph and what had happened and how Joseph had saved Egypt. And so what actually began to happen is the king and the people of Egypt began enslaving the people of Israel, right? And, and it, look, what, look what it says here in, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 12. The more the Egyptians afflicted the Israelites, the more they multiplied and the more they spread out, the more they spread out. So that the Egyptians were in dread of the sons of Israel. So they were afraid of the fact that the people of Israel could rise up. What if a war happened? Who, what side would Israel choose? We don't know. So out of paranoia, the Egyptians began enslaving the Israelites. And sadly, it says this, that Pharaoh even decreed this. Every son who was born, you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. So a part of his plan to hold down the Israelites to not uh, allow them to become a, a problem is to murder the, every son who is born of the Israelites and they were to be cast into the Nile. So the people of Israel found themselves in a horrific situation in Egypt. They were enslaved by the Egyptians, and the Egyptians were killing their sons. But as I said last week, right, God will always bring something good out of a horrific situation, out of a bad situation. God is always going to find a way to reveal himself. Even if what has happened is not his will, He's not the source of the horrific things that have happened, but he can still use what has happened to reveal himself. And that's certainly the case with the story of, of the exodus from Egypt. They didn't, God didn't plan for that to happen so far as he's not the author. He didn't come up with the idea of enslaving the Egyptians. However, he used that for his own purposes. And remember this, 
Remember what we learned last week, that God had made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? All these covenant promises. Well, that, those promises are hanging over the entire book of Exodus and the rest of the Bible as well. But in particular, this story. Think about it. They're in the worst situation they can imagine themselves to be in, and yet God had promised all these amazing things to them. So, these promises are hanging over the story. In other words, I bet you in the back of their minds, the people of Israel were saying, didn't God make covenant promises to us? Why are we in this situation? And so that's the wonderful thing about finding yourself in a bad situation. You can remember God's promises and you can trust in him. Despite the horrible circumstances we find ourselves in, we can remember that God has made promises to us. And guess what? He's always going to bring a redeemer to save his people. He's always going to bring a redeemer to save his people. And in chapter 2, we're told about the birth of Moses. And he is the first great redeemer of the people of Israel. He's the first great savior of the people of Israel. And it says in Jewish tradition that the latter redeemer will be like the first redeemer. The first redeemer is Moses. And who is the latter redeemer? The Messiah, who we believe is Jesus, of course, right? So the story of Jesus, if you think about it, if you read the book of Matthew, the story of the birth of Jesus mirrors the story of the birth of Moses. They were both... Uh, born under a situation where the king had decreed that the firstborn, that the sons, would, would have to be murdered, right? And they were both spared, right? And in the case of Jesus, he was brought to Egypt, which is where Moses was born as well. So there's, there's a parallel going on here between the, the, the final redeemer, Jesus, and the first redeemer, Moses. And we're told about how the mother of Moses, uh, after he was born, he kept Moses hidden, but and it says in Exodus chapter 2, when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank in the Nile, of the Nile. So the basket with Moses in it reached the daughter of Pharaoh. So he was spared what had been decreed. And the daughter of Pharaoh, you think, you know, God using these things for his purposes, what are the chances that the daughter of Pharaoh finds Moses? You know, I'm not saying that God isn't nudging things along as we go along, right? So the daughter of, of Pharaoh finds Moses and takes this baby in as her own. She actually is the one who named, uh, named him. But unlike some of the film adaptions, who here has seen the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and so many other movies that have been made? Actually, unlike that movie and so many others, we don't get too much about Moses' upbringing. We don't know exactly how well he was accepted into the royal family, so to speak. And this actually mirrors Jesus' story because we don't know too much about Jesus' upbringing either. But the implication is, and this is what I think, is that Moses knew that he was a Hebrew. And I think everybody knew that he was a Hebrew. He was in the royal family insofar as that he was the adopted son of the Pharaoh's daughter. But I think everybody knew he was a Hebrew uh, because when he sees uh, an Egyptian uh, killing and abusing uh, a, a Hebrew, he goes and defends the Hebrew and ends up killing that Egyptian. And instead of using the, 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 the royal family to his advantage, he flees. And it's, in other words, he was probably not 100% certain that he would have been able to get off uh, scot-free on, on, uh, on that murder. So he flees to Midian and he marries a priest's daughter named Zipporah and had children with her. And the people of Israel back in Egypt were still suffering under the tyranny of the Egyptians, right? So Moses flees and, and starts a new life in Midian, and yet his brothers and sisters, the, the Hebrews, the, the Israelites, were still under the tyranny, under tyranny in Egypt. So guess what? As I said, the promises of God are always there, right? So God, it says in Exodus 2, God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so God doesn't work in a vacuum. He has his promises and he, he wants to act on his promises, but he has to use people to see those promises made. Think about that. Why aren't we seeing what God wants to be done here in our church and in our area? It's because he has, he's waiting for us to come on board. This is what the story of Moses, especially of the burning bush, is really going to teach us. That God revealed himself to Moses through the burning bush, right? 
and Modus, Moses noticed the burning bush, that it was burning and yet it was not being consumed. And he said this, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. So when the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to look, God called Moses, called to Moses from the midst of the, of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And what did Moses say? Here I am. Now, sometimes we need a burning bush in order for God to get our attention. I, I, I encourage you, don't let it get to that point where we need something dramatic to get our attention for God and for God's work. Rather, let's do God's work now, right? But sometimes we need it. And if there is a burning bush, if there is something drawing you to do God's work, to, do, to live the life of God, what will your response be? Because Moses' response was to say, here am I. And that seems like an obvious response. Uh, if somebody's calling my name, I'll say I'm here. But in Hebrew, the phrase that's under this phrase here in English, here am I, the phrase in Hebrew is actually used many times in the Bible to refer to people who are saying to the Lord, here I am, I'm ready to be used. So what did God do? God revealed himself, right? God revealed himself to Moses and he went as far as revealing his personal name. Have you ever wondered that, that God has his own personal name, just like we each have our own personal name. God has a name and he revealed that to Moses. And what is it? Well, in chapter 3, verse 14, in our translations, it says, I will be who I will be. Or rather, it says, uh, in most of our translations, it says, I am who I am. But that comes from a Hebrew phrase that is better translated as, I will be who I will be. And then he says this in verse 15. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. So what is his name? In English, in our English Bibles, it's represented by four, the, four, uh, the, the word the Lord, right? Where it's all capitalized. But in Hebrew, it's actually four letters. Yod, He, Vav, He. That's the four letters of God's name. And it, scholars don't necessarily know what the, that word means. It's uh, made up of those four letters, but we don't know what the vowels are. So guess, if anybody tells you, uh, you should be pronouncing God's name and here's how to pronounce it. Uh, they don't know, uh, that's not, uh, there's no way to know what God's name actually sounds like. But scholars have enough information to figure out that it might mean he who causes to be. He who causes to be. In other words, God is, he's self-existent. He, he doesn't need anything to exist. And he is the one who causes what will be. In other words, he's transcendent and he's our creator. So the very fact that God even says that he has a name, and it turns out to be this phrase, he who causes to be, which is supposed to speak of his transcendence, it's a little ironic. How can the transcendent God be put into a little box so much so that we can call him by a personal name? But this tells us that even though God is beyond us, even though he's transcendent, even though he's the creator, that God wants to be in relationship with us. That's what God's name is supposed to really communicate to us. By its meaning, it tells us that God is transcendent. But by the very fact that he's revealing his name to us means he wants us to know him, right? Does that make sense? So God wants us to be in relationship with him, but in order for that to happen, we need to be freed from bondage. You see, we are currently, each of us, or at least at some point in our lives, under the bondage of sin. That, that as Paul talks about in his letters, right? That we want to do what's right, but we can't seem to find the way to do it. So we need to be freed from that cycle, that cycle of always wanting to do the right thing, but boy, we just can't seem to break our habits. So God needs to send somebody in order to free us. And in the case of the people of Israel who were enslaved in Egypt, we, we find that Moses was sent on a mission. And guess what it, the word is? I have it on the screen already. Guess what the word is in Greek for somebody who's sent on a mission? An apostle. So Moses is God's apostle sent on a mission to free the people of Israel. And this reminds me of Jesus, of course, who is the one who is ultimately sent by God 
Jesus is God's apostle as well. Jesus himself has apostles, but Jesus is God's apostle, the ultimate apostle of God, sent on a mission, sent to save us, right? To lead us out of bondage. And like Jesus, Moses was given the ability to do miracles. And what were those miracles? You remember from the story, right? The turning of the, the staff into a snake, turning his hand into a leprous hand, and then turning the Nile into blood. These were the miracles that God gave to Moses to demonstrate to Pharaoh and to the people of Israel that he was among him. And that, just as an aside, that reminds me of that's kind of why God does miracles, is to show that God is with you, to show that he's there and, and that you can trust whoever he's doing the miracles through. And so we have to ask ourselves, if he's not doing miracles through us, maybe we need to get in line with the mission that he has for us to, to do, right? But there, there was another thing I wanted to share about the, these miracles that, that uh, God can, gave to Moses to do. Look what it says in Exodus chapter 4. I think this is really interesting. It says, if they will not believe you, this is God speaking to Moses, if they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, the first miracle, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall, and he goes on to, to give more of an example of what he should do. I bring this up to point out and to reiterate something that I said last week, that I think we human beings have been given so much freedom by God that even God himself isn't 100% certain what it's going to take to get us to turn to him, right? Look at this. Look at the words used, if and may. Like, if they, if they won't listen to you because of this, maybe they'll listen to you because of that. That, to me, speaks of the amazing freedom that we have. And God has to do everything that he can. He just, again and again, God is never going to give up on us. But he has to do all that he can in order to, to get our attention. And what that means is, is that the future is not set in stone. And I can understand that, that, that idea that the future is not yet settled. That can be a little scary to people. But I take it as a message of hope, that the future is not yet destined to be, there's no, we don't have a 100% destiny to fulfill. In other words, the future is what we make up. Some, some really smart person, I think his name was Doc Brown, once said, your future is whatever you make it, so make it a good one, right? Did anybody catch that? It's from Back to the Future. Okay, Sarah caught it. <laughs> the future is open, so make it, make it what you want it to be. Make it a good one. So Moses had a mission from God. Moses you know, he could have went off on his own and not done what God was asking him to do, but he agreed to, the, to do the mission. However, like so many of us, I'm including myself in this, maybe you don't know this about me, but I'm not the most confident person ever. I sometimes think I don't have what it takes to, to be your pastor and to do what God is calling me to do. But neither did Moses, right? Moses had that same problem, that he didn't think he was a good enough speaker to deliver God's message to the people of Israel and to Pharaoh. And honestly, God was disappointed in him for having that attitude. You know why? Because God wants us to trust in him. If he's going to choose you to do his work, you better trust in him that he made a good choice. And you, some, you might think like I do, why did you choose me? What, what good can I bring? But God can use all of us and each of us, right? So as long as God is with us, even despite our inadequacies, we can accomplish God's will and his strength. And to help Moses, God appointed Moses' brother, right? So Moses didn't think he was that great of a speaker, but Aaron apparently was. So Moses commissioned Aaron to speak for Moses and to speak for God. And at the end of chapter 4, Moses and Aaron told the people of Israel that God had heard their cries and that he was going to rescue them. And in chapter 5, rather than releasing the people of Israel, guess what Pharaoh did? Pharaoh made their slavery even worse. He enslaved them, increased their labor even further. So guess what? Guess what happened? Rather than blaming Pharaoh, who was the one who made the decision, what did the people of Israel do? They blamed Moses and Aaron. Thanks a lot for uh, coming in and, and trying to free us. All it resulted in is in us having even worse, even a, a worse situation. And so that comes from a certain degree of, of uh, immaturity. Like people tend to do that instead of blaming who's actually responsible, they blame the messenger, right? They blame the one speaking the truth. The person speaking the truth is just telling you the way it is. It's not their fault. 
So we need to remember that when people speak the truth to us, let's pause and ask ourselves, okay, who is the actual cause of the situation? And a lot of the times it might be yourself, right? So that's, you know, we're seeing in the story of the people of Israel being enslaved that it's mirroring what we go through when people present to us the story or the reality of our sin. And what did Jesus do when he went to the people of Israel in his day? And he proclaimed to them that they needed to repent of their sin. Did they always accept it with open arms and with understanding? No. They tended to uh, get angry with him. And indeed, that eventually led to his own crucifixion. So in chapter 6, we're told that God promised that he was going to act. That despite the shortcomings of Israel, despite what had their reaction to Moses and Aaron, that he was indeed going to honor his promises and he was going to deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt. And that's why in chapter 6 we get these I will statements. I highlighted them on the screen for you. That there are several I will statements. I'm not going to take the time to read this passage, but go ahead and read chapter 6 when you get the chance. But these I will statements are statements of God saying that I will deliver you. I will do the such and such in order to get you to the point where you need to be in order to be saved. And guess what? Each of these mirrors our own salvation experience. God promises what? To first bring us out of the burdens of sin and deliver us from bondage, just like he promised Israel. God powerfully redeems us, right? He promises that he will redeem us. He will do so through the difficult times, just like Israel was going through difficult times. God promises to redeem them, and God promised, promised to redeem them and promises to redeem us out of our difficult times. So then get, what does he do? He then takes us as his own, and he promises to enter into relationship with him. He then promises to give us the promised land, right? Which, in my opinion, first, the promised land is metaphorical for our own growth as believers, but it's also literal as well. Who here has been to the land of Israel, right? That is the land promised to his people. And that's what God will do for us if we will choose. So God will, you know, get, go into action on our behalf because of the promises he's made to his people. And in chapter 7, this is really interesting, Moses as God, right? Have you ever seen this in the, in the, in the book of Exodus? It says, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh. This is God speaking to Moses. I make you, Moses, as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. So Moses was God to Pharaoh in that Moses was representing God to Pharaoh, speaking on God's behalf. So this to me, look at this. This is one of the simplest ways to understand Jesus and his relationship with God. It's not that God, that Jesus is literally God. It's that Jesus represents God to us just as Moses represented God to, to the Pharaoh. So you could say this, that, that Jesus represents God so much, so perfectly, that you can look at Jesus and say, my Lord and my God. Right? You remember when Thomas said that in John chapter 20? That he proclaimed to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And yet, the same could be said of Moses. He represented God to Pharaoh. But no one actually thought that Moses was literally God, right? So to me, I think this is, this is the way we're supposed to understand Jesus, that he is God to us. He is essential for our salvation. Without Jesus, we are not saved. But he is not literally God. He represents God to us. That, to me, shows us in the story of Moses, just like the, latter rede just like the first redeemer, so will be the latter redeemer, right? Remember when I said that? So Jesus is just like Moses in that he represents God, but he's even better at, the, at it. He represents God fully. So Moses was sent on a mission from God, and Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. So what does this tell us? This tells us that no matter what your age is, whether you're young or old, it doesn't matter. God will use you and can use you. Do you think of your age and do you think that maybe your time is up and, and God can't use you anymore. Well, if God can use Moses and Aaron in their 80s to do such a monumental task, then God can use us at any age for what he has for us here. And so just because, and get this, this is what happened to Moses and Aaron, that they went to Pharaoh and Pharaoh's response wasn't like, sure, go ahead. Yeah, 
you know, you asked me nicely, so you might as well go ahead and take the Israelites out. He said no, right? Pharaoh said no, repeatedly said no. And you might think to yourself that what I'm doing isn't effective. It's not having the effect I was hoping, right? But look what it says. Moses said to Pharaoh, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. His response was to not listen to the message. It didn't have the effect that Moses wanted. But you know what? Jesus went through the same thing. And if Jesus can't get 100% of people to, to listen to him and to do what he says, then what chance do we have? And it gives us hope. Because look what Jesus said. In a, he's saying this in a parable in Luke chapter 16. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. <laughs> So Jesus is saying to us, don't lose heart if people aren't hearing your message, if people aren't responding the way you want to. Because guess what? They have the witness of scripture there in front of them. And that is so much more so the case today. Who here thinks that in, here in Canada that, that there's somebody in Canada who doesn't have a Bible or at least access to a Bible? I would say that there is at least, uh, there, that in a person's life, there's at least some Bible somewhere for them to read. Right? In other words, there's no excuse. And what Jesus is telling us, listen, they should be listening and obeying the scripture. Even if somebody rises from the dead, if, they're not, if their heart's not in the right spot, they're not going to listen to you. So that teaches me and it teaches all of us that, that we really need to be you know, focusing on doing the job that God has for us to do. And, and it's, it's really counterintuitive, but not focusing too much on the results. Right? It, it's, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't at all. But what I'm saying is, is that let's not get discouraged when the results that, that, we, that come in aren't exactly what we were looking for. It can be frustrating for sure. But we need to rely on God. Okay, so guess what? Chapters 7 through 11, we have the plague, the 10 plagues that God brought upon the people of, of, of Egypt. 10 different plagues. And I think God wanted to get the attention of the Pharaoh and to demonstrate to him and to demonstrate to the people that he was the supreme God and that the gods that they served were false gods. Like, you know how many gods the Egyptians had? A lot. I, I looked them up and I can't give you the names because I don't even know how to pronounce them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how each of these plagues, and this is what some scholars say, each of these plagues was directly given in order to counter some false god that the Egyptians had. So we'll go through them, right? The first plague, turning the Nile into blood, was to demonstrate God's superiority over the gods of the Nile, right? Smiting the land with frogs was to symbolically spite an Egyptian frog god. They even had a frog god, and so the frogs were there to spite that god. Thirdly, God made the dust of the earth turn into gnats, and that was to spite Egypt's earth god. Then God sent swarms of insects, to spite Egypt's fly god. You know, what, what do you need a fly god for? I don't know. But, but God was showing them that the futility of having so many gods, right? Of having any gods other than him. Number five, God brought a severe pestilence, which killed the Egyptians' cattle. And this was in order to spite the Egyptians' gods that were associated with bulls and cows. Then God sent boils upon the people and, and the animals. And this was to spite the god of healing, the Egyptian god of healing. God then sent very heavy hail upon Egypt, and this was to spite Egypt's sky god and the gods, their gods of agriculture. God then sent locusts, and this was to spite the god that the Egyptians worshipped that protected them from locusts. They had a god that protected them from locusts, right? And, and God sent lo locusts to show them, no, that god doesn't do anything for you. And then God sent a severe darkness upon the land, and this was to spite the Egyptian sun gods, and their sun gods were kind of failure, like Ra. And so all, all of these plagues were to show and to demonstrate how superior God is. And, and you might say, and I've certainly questioned, isn't it a little cruel for God to send these plagues upon the people of Egypt? And there's a way to work that out if you understand it, that God is allowing these plagues. He might not be the exact source of the plagues. Point being is that there, sometimes God will do dramatic things in order to get our attention in order to demonstrate who he is. And the last one, the, one, the last one is probably the most horrific 
I actually would say it is the most horrific of all the plagues. It's the death of the firstborn, right? God promised and God said that, that, that each firstborn son of Egypt would die. And, and sadly, this is a, a demonstration of God's judgment over the people of Egypt, right? That they were worshiping false gods, they had enslaved his people, and the death of the firstborn was to show that judgment and to demonstrate that. And, and um, again, there, there might be a way to understand it where it's, God might not be the exact source, but it's, it's there in scripture. And we have to, uh, that's part of being good Bible studiers is you have to deal with the text as you have it, right? But look what he said. In, no matter what happens, and every time that, that God brings a judgment upon the people, there will always be something. There will be, always be a way out, right? And so what did he say? God said, take some of the blood of the lamb and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it, right? So why put blood on the doorposts? God gave the reasoning in chapter 12, verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. So even if the death of the firstborn did directly come from God, you could say, well, he gave you a way of escape. He gave you a way of salvation. So it really was up to each person to decide for themselves whether they would accept that salvation. And guess what? That teaches us about our salvation, right? Because Paul says that Christ is our Passover lamb who has been sacrificed. So the blood of the unblemished lamb on the doorpost of the house allows God's judgment to pass over that house. And the same is true if we think about the doorposts of our hearts, right? If we would apply the blood of the lamb, that is Jesus, on the doorposts of our hearts, God's judgment certainly will pass over us. Now, unlike what he did for the previous nine plagues, this time Pharaoh released the people. He called Moses and Aaron at night and he said, rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go worship the Lord as you have said. So under God's guidance, Moses led the people of Israel out. And then in chapter 14, Pharaoh regretted letting the people go, right? And what did he do? He sent the army of Egypt out to uh, chase after the Israelites. And guess what? The Israelites reached the Red Sea. They were now facing the Red Sea. They had the Egyptians behind them, desert on their right and their left, and just water in front of them. They had nowhere, nowhere to go. So... This is what happened. Moses said, because obviously the Israelites were understandably, understandably afraid. Moses said, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see again forever. So what did God do? God miraculously parted the sea for Moses. And as the video said, maybe the fishes were looking at them as they were walking through. But he, they miraculously parted the sea. He miraculously parted the sea and the Israelites made it safely to the other side. And when the Egyptians then attempted to follow them, the water returned to normal and drowned them. And this teaches us that as we walk through the waters of baptism, as we enter into this life, right, our, our sinful past will be trying to catch up with us. Who here has become a Christian and yet still fell into some of the sin that they used to commit before? I think it's all happened to us, right? So the key is, if we trust in God, if we continue to walk forward, eventually we will never have to see our own sinful life again, just like the Israelites never had to deal with the Egyptians again. God promises us that he will get us through this life when it comes to standing up and, and standing firm in his righteousness. So God had done a mighty work for the Israelites, and their exodus from Egypt was memorialized every year in what? The Passover, right? The, the, the holidays of Passover and unleavened bread. And the most important aspect of Passover is the Seder meal, the meal in which you take the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs and so forth. And it says in Exodus 13, you shall tell your son on that day saying, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. I know Sarah's been to Egypt. Who else here has been to Egypt? Yeah, we have a few people. But for the rest of us, I've never been to Egypt. I can't say of what the Lord did for me in Egypt. And certainly none of us were there during the time of Israel's slavery. So how are we supposed to fulfill this commandment that we are supposed to say to our children, 
It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This tells us that we're supposed to tell our children about our own personal story of salvation. Right? Maybe not the literal Egypt, but the Egypt of sin and death. Right? So that's what the story of Exodus tells us and the story of Passover greatly informs the overall story of the Bible because it is the story of the first great redemption of God's people. A story that shows us what it looks like when God saves his people. It's a story of God's deliverance of his people from Egypt, and it shows us that God is willing to meet us where we're at in order to bring us out of the darkness. So this story shows us that God is willing to save us, and he'll do so through his appointed redeemer. And this is what it says in Exodus 14, this is the end of the section we're going to look at, that, that the people saw that the great power, the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord, and get this, and in his servant Moses. Look how Moses is coupled with God, right? They believed in the Lord, but they also believed in Moses. Why? Because through Moses, they were able to get God's salvation. And who does this teach us about? That's what Jesus is for us and for all of God's people. Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me. Again, demonstrating that they're not one and the same. However, in order to get to God's salvation, we need to go through Jesus. Jesus is the final redeemer. So let's have Sarah and Paul come. We're going to sing one last song. And it's, it's a song it's, that's been around for a while, but it really shows us how we can celebrate that Jesus died for our sins and he has been raised to newness of life and he is our great redeemer. So the key to being a part of this, though, is heeding his call. Because if the people of Israel did not heed the call of Moses, they wouldn't have been saved. So if you want to be saved, if you want to have entrance into the promised land, we need to heed the call of the final redeemer, the great redeemer, that is Jesus. So let's stand together and let's sing the song.